Hey everyone, I'm Aaron from Finkton Languages, and today we're going to talk about what I call the three pillars of language practice, and that is language acquisition, comprehensible input, and conversation practice. The three things that you need to be doing when you're practicing your target language if you want to learn that language. All right, there's a lot of other things that people might recommend to you grammar drills, exercises, workbooks, grammar explanations, and things like that. Those things are all fine if that's what you want to do. Um, you know, spending lots of time on Duolingo. Uh, you know, if, I'm not going to tell you to don't do that. I'm not going to tell you to don't do that. <laughs> Hola, Emmanuel from Argentina. I'm good. How are you? Um Grammar explanation here or there can be helpful, but the pillars of language learning, the things that are going to hold up your progress in the language, in my opinion, are vocabulary acquisition, comprehensible input, and language, uh, I'm sorry, conversation practice. And I apologize before we go any further. My allergies have been kicking my butt today. Um, it's not normally like this, but I just woke up this morning with the worst runny nose in history. <laughs> so, um, I apologize. I might have to blow my nose. <laughs> it's kind of disgusting. Anyways. Uh, yeah. Hello. How are, how are all of you? I see a few, a few comments here. Rachel Harris has always wanted to learn Tibetan. She says, I'm actually starting to immerse myself through content that YouTube made for beginners. Excellent. I definitely think that's what you should be doing. Um, that is, uh, you know, one of the things we're going to be talking about today. Alexandra says, hard question. Now, uh, now I'm thinking about Armenian. I love the script and the sound. Yes, obviously. The, so the question being what I asked right from the very beginning, uh, what language have you always wanted to learn, but you don't know yet? I said, for me, it's Mandarin Chinese. I would say ancient Greek also falls in there. Okay. So, by the way, if anyone has any questions, oh, Sawati Kap, Kochapat. If you have any questions for me, please leave them along the way. I always want these um, these live streams to be uh, uh, conversations, discussions, not monologues, right? If I wanted to just say something to you guys, I would just record a video and upload it. But these these live streams are for you guys to interact with me. So the three pillars of language learning, like I said, um, vocabulary acquisition, comprehensible input, uh, conversation practice. All right. Why is vocabulary one of the most important things? I, I've talked to other language learners about this. Uh, I've talked to Steve Kaufman. I had an interview with him a few months ago. Um, and uh, I agree with his with his his standpoint, his philosophy on this. One of the most important things you can do as a language learner, especially early on when you're a beginner, is acquire lots of words. In my opinion, it's much more important to know many words than it is to know all of the grammar rules, okay? And uh, the reason being is that if you know vocabulary words, especially verbs, nouns, adjectives, some of the little connecting words, conjunctions, um, some prepositions, adverbs, things like that, if you know a lot of vocabulary words, you can more or less communicate what you want to communicate. Okay. You might say it wrong, but you at least have the words to express what you want to express. If you know all of the grammar rules, you know how to conjugate verbs, you know about your noun declensions and, and your case endings, and you know all of the rules for prepositions and stuff, but you don't have many vocabulary words, what can you really say? It's like... You know, you're going to war with a heavy machine gun, but you don't have any ammo, right? Um, 
learning vocabulary words allows you, I mean, I guess that's not a very good analogy because the ammo doesn't do you any good <laughs> without the machine gun either. Um, I guess the mortar rounds in Saving Private Ryan kind of did. But um, my point's being that when you, uh, when you know lots of vocabulary words, you can at least have a conversation. You can understand what people are saying. You might not catch every bit of grammar that someone uses, uh, and that's okay because you'll be able to piece together, you'll be able to make sense of the pieces of the conversation if you know the vocabulary words that they're, that they're using, okay? So, um, yeah, there's a good example. Miss, Missy says, uh, a cookbook without ingredients, right? That's, a, that's actually a really good analogy. I might start using that, okay? If I give you a recipe for cookies and I give you all of the instructions, bake, stir, mix, crack, but I don't tell you any of the ingredients, you're gonna be really confused and you won't know what to do. If I give you all the ingredients and don't tell you what to do, there's a good chance you can figure out, I gotta crack the egg before I put it in the bowl. I gotta mix the flour and the egg and the and, you know the the chocolate chips together. Then I gotta bake it. I might have to guess what temperature to bake it, but I'll end up with something more or less edible, right? Yeah, that's a good analogy there. If you don't have any words, you just can't say anything. No matter if you have a good understanding of how the language works, okay? And um, that I a lot of times I draw the difference between a linguist and a polyglot. A polyglot is someone who speaks lots of languages, right? They've learned lots of languages. Whereas linguists study languages, but not with the end goal of being able to speak those languages. A linguist studies language um, as more of an academic endeavor. Okay, they want to learn about the language, but not necessarily interested in learning to speak the language. Okay. Um, and that's a fine goal if you are, in fact, a linguist and you're just trying to learn information about the language. Most of us are trying to learn how to communicate in a language, though. And so I think learning vocabulary is more important than learning grammar rules. I'm trying to drink lots of warm liquids to combat my allergies today. I don't know why, but they're just murdering me today. This doesn't normally happen. And there are different ways of acquiring vocabulary, focusing on vocabulary. Of course, you can use some kind of SRS system, Anki, Memrise, Drops, um, the SRS on, uh, on, on Link, right? And uh, those, are, those are fine. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking through the comments here. Hello, Rasmus. Uh, thanks for thanks for the comments, everyone. Aggie Battery says, I'm learning, it's what I'm learning now, French. It should have started 20 years ago when I was first interested. Yeah, yeah, that happens to a lot of people. Um, okay, so if you don't know, an SRS system is basically an app or a computer program or something that uh, shows you essentially a flashcard every once in a while. Um, uh, and they have some system for deciding when it's most effective to show you the flashcard. All right, and those are fine. Um, if you do decide to use an SRS system, I recommend using full phrases, not just single words, because single word translations, they don't really tell you how a word is supposed to be used in a language. Okay, if you see the word in context of a phrase or a sentence, that's going to give you a much better idea of how that word should be used. Okay. Um, you can do what I do, what I've been doing with Thai. By the way, if you're interested in following my personal language journey and seeing like um, what I you, what I do and what I recommend, I've been doing this new series called The Diary of a Language Learner, where I basically just take you through what I'm doing this week in my language learning. Okay. Um, and one of the main things I've been doing is I've been going through these different stories, all right? And every, I know you probably can't read anything on here because it's all in Thai. It's mostly in Thai. But every page I have dedicated to a certain story that I've been reading, all right? And I'll just go through and write down some of the vocabulary words in that story that I don't recognize, all right? Um, so it's sort of an intensive reading plan. 
Uh, see this here, this story is called Growing Plants. And then you can see I have lots of uh, vocabulary words that I wrote down that have to do with growing plants. Like here, grow, get, put, uh, help, wait. You have to wait for the plant to grow. Um, you know, add, like add water, uh, sprout, grow, develop. Okay, all of these words are coming along with, um, uh, all of these words are coming along with just reading the story that I'm uh, that I'm been reading. I read the same story almost every day. Okay, excuse me. Um, and I've just been trying to focus on the vocabulary words in these stories because it's in context. I'm seeing how they're used every day. All right. Um, I think I might. I've had mixed relationship with SRS systems between saying Memrise was like maybe my favorite or second favorite app. Now I really know SRS. I think I'm gonna try to start getting back into SRS a little bit. I'm gonna dabble in the SRS, allow it to be sort of a supplement to my main language learning, comprehensible input and conversation practice. All right, and um, Maybe I'll start doing that this week when I'm uh, on vacation. Well, no, in America, we're celebrating Thanksgiving this week. Not in all of America. In the United States. In Canada, they celebrated Thanksgiving last month. And most other countries don't even celebrate it at all. <laughs> he says, that's how I've been using it. Using, what, SRS as like a supplement? I think that's a good way to use SRS. Um Anyways, my goal right now is just trying to, to try to learn lots of words, all right? And the, the secret to this is you have to realize learning words is a process of learning and then forgetting, learning and forgetting. And you go through that process over and over, okay? Um, you're not going to see a word and then remember it forever. You're going to see the word and then almost immediately forget it. You're gonna have to look it up five or six times before you start to get familiar with it. Sometimes, I shouldn't say all the time, excuse me. Um, sometimes you'll see a word and it just clicks for some reason. Uh, that does happen, but you can't rely on that for most of the words that you're using. Okay, so I all this to say, I think learning vocabulary words is uh, one of the most crucial aspects of learning language, especially early on. Later, as time goes on, maybe spend a little bit more time trying to figure out how sentences fit together correctly and learn about syntax a little bit here and there. Um, but by and large, I'm trying to learn words so that I can communicate. I will communicate imperfectly, for sure, but I can communicate something. I can communicate at all if I have the words. Z says, SRS can just be so uninvasive if that's a, if that's a word. Yeah, it works well with, it works with the learning for getting cycle so well. And that's the point of SRS, right? With SRS, they plan on uh, trying to refresh your memory of a word as soon as you would forget it. Okay, and, and that's the, the point. That's the beauty of the SRS system. It can be uninvasive um, for me. I find with Anki in particular, um, if you go a few days without using Anki, then you're just piling up new vocabulary or old vocabulary words that you haven't been refreshing. And then when you go back to Anki after two, three days, you're just overwhelmed with like 600 vocabulary words that you have to learn today. Uh, and that can be kind of tough. Um, but yeah, there's better, you know, I think Memrise is a little bit better on that, um, on that front. Uh, uh, the SRS in, in Link, L-I-N-G-Q, the SRS system in Link is nice because it's designed to use vocabulary that you're already encountering in the readings that you're going through. So it mixes SRS with learning vocabulary and content, and that's nice, uh, in context, and that's nice. Um, Rachel Harris says, whether or not you remember the words depends on how relevant it is to you. And that's a hundred percent correct. Um, 
I, I thank you for bringing that up because that's something uh, that I also wanted to talk about. Learn vocabulary first that is relevant to you, okay? Uh, Duolingo is really notorious for teaching words and phrases like, uh, my brother's cow just ate a lawyer. <laughs> you know, like just ridiculous stuff that you'll never actually have to um, Now granted, brother, cow, lawyer, ate, those words all might be relevant to you, uh, depending, you know, if there's a lawyer in your family, if your brother is a lawyer, then that's a, actually a relevant uh, term. Not, not the whole phrase is, is relevant, but, you know, they're, they're teaching you relevant vocabulary words. Um, but let's say you're a blogger. Shouldn't you learn the word for blogger before you word, learn the word for lawyer and cook and actor and governor and, you know, like all these other, you know, pilot, teacher. The first thing that I want to be able to talk about in my target language is things that I might actually have to talk about, things about myself. Yeah, Z says, my horse speaks Thai very well. Exactly. I'm never going to have to say that. Um, I want to be able to say things about myself. So those are the first things I learn things that are relevant to me. And then I practice those, those conversations in my target language with as many people as I can. Uh, and I'm getting lots of repetition and I'm still going through that process of forgetting and remembering because every time I, I go to say something about myself, uh, I'm going to forget it at first. And then I ask them, hey, how do I say this? And then, and then they tell me, and then I go to have the same conversation with someone else. And maybe that time I remember how to say this thing about myself that I wanted to say in the past. Or maybe I forget again, and then I just have to go through that process of forgetting and relearning one more time. Um, so I so vocabulary first, especially verbs, uh, nouns, adjectives, things like that. I just made a video recently on why verbs are so important. Um, and in particular, words that are relevant to me. Okay. Um, so that's one of the pillars of language practice, making sure you focus on learning lots of words, okay? Worksheets are not a pillar. Grammar exercises are not a pillar. Uh, explanations of grammar, not a pillar of language practice. Learning lots of words, that's a pillar, okay? It holds up your language learning. You cannot learn a language without learning as many words as you can. Um, Kutchapat says, I have to use new vocabularies I learned to keep them from fading. Exactly. As soon as you, you learn a new word, go ahead and try to find a way to incorporate that word into your conversations. It will help it sink in a lot better than just doing a memorize app or Anki SRS system, uh, you know, once a day or twice a day or whatever. So vocabulary, learn lots of it. Comprehensible input is the other pillar, all right? And this is something you should be doing a lot of, in my opinion. Comprehensible input means, well, when I say input, what I'm talking about is reading and writing. I'm sorry, uh, reading and listening as opposed to output, which is speaking and writing, okay? And input is really nice and really helpful because you can do it by yourself all day long and you can get um, lots of exposure to the language. You're sort of internalizing by seeing the way other people speak and, and, and the way other people write. Uh, you're internalizing some of those rules without having to explicitly learn the rules, which can be confusing and kind of abstract. You're seeing it in a more concrete way because you're seeing it on a page and you're seeing examples of how people actually use the language. And I think example sentences are a lot more powerful than grammar explanations, okay? Um, you, you know, rather than having someone explain to me exactly how Spanish verb endings work, I'm probably gonna forget their explanation very quickly. And it might be okay, you know, uh, it might help me notice better if they give me a short explanation, but uh, the vast majority of the time that I'm going to spend learning Spanish verb endings, 
it is not going to be listening to someone explain the rules to me. It's going to be looking at how people actually use it. Give me examples of Spanish verb endings, and then it will sink in better. Okay, and so that's the part of the beauty of comprehensible input. Okay, um, and of course, when I say comprehensible input, um, it means that the input you're taking in, whatever you're reading or whatever you're listening to, should be comprehensible. You should be able to understand most of it. Okay, doesn't mean you understand 100%, right? Maybe there's a word here and there. So there's a few grammatical uh, uh, features in the text that you're reading that you don't understand, and that's okay. You don't, your goal is not to understand 100% of it. Your goal is to just get lots of exposure. In fact, you don't want to be reading things. If you, if you understand 100% of whatever you're reading or listening to, you're not learning a whole lot. Maybe you're re reinforcing some of the things that you already learned. Um, but I want to be exposed to new features of the language that I don't understand yet. Okay, so uh, you probably want to be able to understand at least 90% of what you're reading. All right, and that's part of, part of the reason why uh, I have this book. I, you know, I wrote this book. I'm actually going to be releasing a new book very soon, hopefully before Christmas. Um, the first one was a storybook about little dragons. Um, it was designed for adult language learners. So it was very basic, but designed for adults to be very simple. Um, I feel like I marketed it as being a little too kitty. So the next one is about zombies. So be on the lookout for that. But that's what comprehensible input is. And I've showed you guys this, this book before that I read in Thai. And I would just read through this book every day. And the beauty of these is that um, you see the story in front of you, okay? Uh, you see what's happening in the story and, and that helps you get a better understanding of what's actually going on in the story, okay? So even if you don't understand all of the words, you can, um, you can sort of guess what's happening and guess the meaning of some of the words without having already having an explicit understanding of those words. Rachel Harris says, it's like why little children listen to stories every night. Yeah, that's very helpful, listening to stories. And not only, not only is it helpful for language learning, but it's also just very fun, okay? It's a lot more fun to sit and read a story. You know, it can have a little bit of mystery, a little bit of intrigue in the story. It can have a surprise ending. It can keep you on your toes. It's a lot more enjoyable to read through that story than to read through a grammar book. You know, and you're reading boring stuff like I before E except after C and when rhyming with way as in neighbor and way, right? Like you're, you're reading through all these grammar rules and it doesn't quite make sense and you forget the rule like a week later. It's, you know, and you really have to use a lot of determination to force yourself to read through these textbooks. Um, as opposed to something that's pretty enjoyable, reading through the story, it, you know, you're you're exposing your, you know, you're exposing yourself to the language, um, but it, it's not that hard. It's it's kind of fun, and that so that's what I shoot for, especially once you get to like the intermediate level and you can start reading stories and and articles and things that actually interest you, rather than, admittedly, the pretty basic beginner stories of about a, a little dragon, right. Um, but that's also part of the reason why I format these books in the way that I do this little dragon book and also my next, uh, zombie story that I'm going to release, uh, called, uh, zombie girlfriend is the name of it. It starts off as a children's story, more or less very simple with pictures to help you understand what's going on. And then as you progress through, you go up to higher levels and the story gets a little bit more complex, right? It's designed to holds the interest of language learners who are, uh, who are not just uh, trying to learn a language, but they're also just interested in going through the stories, right? And the stories are designed to keep you reading by holding your interest um, for reasons other than language learning. Do I have my Spanish book here? Here it is, yeah. Like here's, a, a, I have these selected readings in easy Spanish, intermediate Spanish, you know, and it's 
uh, the Jungle Book, Treasure Island, The Origin of Species, for, you know, J Jules Verne, Arabian Nights, stories that are written for adults. Okay, um, comprehensible input makes language learning so much more fun, so much more attainable, so much more relaxed. Um, and you should definitely be doing that if you're learning a language. This is another one of the pillars that is going to hold up your language learning, along with focusing on vocabulary, uh, getting lots of incomprehensible input, and then my last one, conversation practice. Oh, and I want to go through some of the comments here. Uh, can you not say that higher interest, the input being like really, really compelling can make up for it being less comprehensible? What do you think about that? It can be, but if you are, if it's less comprehensible, like less than 90% comprehensible, you're going to have to do a lot of work um, to, to read the story. And if it's, a, if it feels like work, it won't be quite as fun for most people, obviously make that decision for yourself. Um, but that's why they say input should be comprehensible and compelling. Okay. Because if it's fun and you want to do it and it doesn't feel like work, then you're going to do it a lot more. And that's the most effective language learning tool is something that you do a lot, something that you can integrate into your life. Um, Sonia says, I learn better when content is audio visual. Yeah. And that's great point. Um, that's why with my stories, at least I, always intend to use pictures and text and um, have a narrator so that you can listen as you read along. Um, condensed articles about your favorite topics are good too. Exactly. Yeah. But again, about your favorite topics, things that already interest you, whether you're interested in fashion or cooking or mountain climbing or politics or history or medieval fantasy literature, find what interests you, find what can hold your interest. Right now I'm reading The Witcher in Spanish, right? And um, uh, my Spanish is pretty good. So I, you know, I don't have to be reading basic children's books, but I don't have to be intrinsically motivated to learn Spanish in order to read The Witcher. All right, I just enjoy reading fantasy novels so I go ahead and I do that because it's fun and it's enjoyable and I can, okay? Um, as, opposed, as opposed to reading a, a, a textbook, which would take a lot of determination for me to read all the time. Okay. Um, yeah, learning languages from media that you're interested in is enjoyable. It absolutely is. All right, so that leaves me with Learn vocabulary, uh, comprehensible input, and conversation practice. All right. Most of us have the goal of learning a foreign language because we want to be able to talk to other people in that language. Okay, that's our goal. We want to be able to communicate. We want to be able to have conversations in the target language. And there's this strange idea that the way you're supposed to learn language is by memorizing lots of grammar explanations. But really the way you learn a skill is by practicing using that skill and you start off very poorly, okay? You don't read a book about how to play piano and then go and sit down and play Mozart. You start playing Mary Had a Little Lamb and first you mess up on 50% of the notes, but as you get better, you start to make less and less mistakes, fewer and fewer mistakes. And your playing becomes more accurate and more enjoyable until you get to the point finally where you're playing actually because you're good and not because you're trying to get better. But for the first months, I, however much, however long it takes, months or years, you're playing uh, not because you actually sound good, but because you're trying to get better, okay? If you're going to be a pilot, you cannot, I don't care how many books about aviation you read. You can read every book about how to fly a plane and I am not getting in a plane with you until you've had 5,000 hours of flight time in the co-pilot seat, all right? And while you're practicing flying that plane, you're not flying the plane because you're trying to get from point A to point B, you're flying the plane because you want to get better 
at flying airplanes. The same goes for language practice, okay? You cannot read a textbook about Spanish and finish the book able to speak Spanish. Well, you can if you do other things, but the book will not get you to that point. You have to practice using Spanish and you're gonna make lots of mistakes at first. And when you first start speaking Spanish, your goal is not to have a conversation because you need something. Well, it might be, but you need to have lots of conversations in Spanish because that is what you do to learn Spanish. The conversations are part of the journey of becoming fluent in Spanish, okay? And, and you cannot have a successful conversation in Spanish until after you've had many unsuccessful conversations. And it can be really scary, right? Because you go into a Spanish conversation or a conversation in whatever language you're learning, and you know for sure you're gonna make lots of mistakes. And some of those mistakes will be embarrassing. You will mess up the language that you're trying to speak, okay? And people might laugh at you, and it's terrifying. But you just need to have the ability to overcome that fear because you will not progress in your target language until you start having conversations in that language and until you start messing up that language. So it takes an attitude adjustment. You need to have an attitude that says, I am a language learner. And that means I do not speak the language perfectly yet. I'm going to make lots of mistakes. Hillary says, preach. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I'm going on a rant here. It means I'm going to make lots of mistakes. But I'm proud of that because that is a badge of honor for me. That shows off my status as a language learner. Okay, no one expects me to speak the language perfectly yet. That's not even on the table. That's not a menu option, right? People expect me to make lots of mistakes. But when I make lots of mistakes, I am showing that I am the kind of bold and competent person who is capable of learning a language. I'm in the process of learning the language. Now, I could go into the conversation and avoid making mistakes by speaking as little as possible. I could go into the conversation and sort of give one word answers and I could mumble my words so my bad pronunciation isn't as relevant. Notice how I said bad pronunciation right there? A little irony for you. I could, I could, say, I could just say, yeah. Mm -hmm. I could nod instead of speaking. I could use as few words as possible and maybe get by without making a mistake. But then I ain't learning nothing. You have to just be able to speak. You have to throw yourself out there, be confident, be bold, make lots of mistakes and use the language a lot. Use lots of words, even though you know you're gonna use them wrong. That's what you do. And sooner or later, you stop forgetting the words that you've been using over and over and over. You start making fewer and fewer mistakes. You have to stop less often to try to think of that one word that never quite comes to mind. And it's a very slow process. You might not even notice it happening, but sooner or later you become competent in the language that you're trying to learn and you actually are able to hold a conversation. And you can have conversations just for the fun of it, rather than early on when you just hold lots of conversations so that you can progress. It happens. Aggie says, going back to language learning phrases through SRS, I totally take advantage of that feature and link, if for no other reason than to understand the real meaning and not just the literal translation. Yeah. And that's a, also going back to what we're talking about right now. That happens a lot in conversation. I'll notice the way people use a, a word that's different from the way I expected them to use that word because maybe I was using a flashcard or I was using an SRS system that gave me a translation of the word. Well, translations of single words aren't always very good because I used that word in my language one way and maybe the translation of that word gets used very differently in another language, right? Like um, 
for, the, for example, in Spanish, me gusta, which always gets translated as I like, but it really means something pleases me rather than I like something. Okay. And if I just read on Anki or on Memorize that me gusta means I like, then I'm going to be very confused about the word order. Okay. Because I, I'm going to, uh, it, because then the verb conjugations don't make sense. You're conjugating the verbs backwards and, uh, it just doesn't make sense. But if I use lots of phrases that just say, me gusta, te gusta, um, yo te gusto, right? Um, eso, eh, eso nos gusta. Uh, you're going to get lots of examples of how to use that word in context. And it just makes so much more sense. Axel Yamas, Lamas says, uh, what would you recommend for someone who doesn't live in a place where native speakers are? Fortunately, we live in the 21st century and there's native speakers right here, right in your iPad, in your cell phone, in your computer. You can talk to native speakers. Get on HelloTalk, get on Reddit, get on italki, um, get on YouTube, uh, follow some native speakers on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. Um, there are native speakers that you can interact with. Find a Facebook group dedicated to the language that you're learning. Okay, every language has something. There's a forum, there's a subreddit, there's a Facebook group. There's something that you can do. Okay, you can find native speakers to talk to, talk to and to have message conversations with, right? Like you don't need to dedicate an hour a day to having a conversation with someone. You can message them. How do you message your friends? Sometimes you might stay up late messaging them, especially if you like that person. But generally speaking, you send them a message, then you go about doing whatever you were already doing that day. And then when you come back to your phone, if you see that they sent you a message, then you respond, right? And that's how text messages work. Um, it's unintrusive. It doesn't obstruct your plan for the day. All right, Rachel Harris says, if you're not that tech savvy, you can also use shortwave to, uh, to get in touch with someone. Like so shortwave radio? I don't know anyone who does that, but uh, yeah. Actually, that sounds more tech savvy to me because I have no idea how to do that. Anyways, those are the three pillars. Vocabulary acquisition, comprehensible input, and conversation practice. You need to do all of those things, okay? And if you do a lot of that, you will progress in your language very quickly. You can do other things that are not pillars. For example, going to a Spanish class where they teach you all the grammar rules and make you memorize grammar tables and stuff like that. Um, you can do that. It's just not a pillar that will not hold up your language learning. What you need to do is vocabulary acquisition, comprehensible input, and conversation practice. That's my rant. Thank you for watching and have a good day. Bye-bye.